Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. I'm, I'm an adjunct professor at the Department of Engineering Science and then one of the organizers of this lecture series. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sharam Marivani and also uh, Kate uh, uh, Lab, who, uh, who both helped me in, uh, in setting up this, uh, uh, the lecture series. Uh, now, before I uh, introduce our guest speaker, uh, let me mention that uh, Kate has uh, already ordered uh, pizza, and I hope that both our speaker and also you uh, have the chance to stay uh, after 5.30 to, to uh, basically enjoy the pizza. It's really good, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, uh, our uh, guest speaker for uh, next, uh, well, I say April the 5th, is uh, Dr. Sergio uh, uh, Canavati. He's an assistant professor at the School of Business and uh, Economics, Economics at Sonoma State University. And the title of his talk is Engineering Knowledge, Industry Experience, and the Recognition of Opportunities for Entrepreneurship and uh, Innovation. Our guest speaker for today is Dr. <coughs> Zia Rang Zhang. She's an assistant professor at the, uh, at the Computer Engineering at uh, San Francisco State University. And the title of her talk is Toward the Next Generation Neural Controlled Artificial uh, Limb. I looked at, uh, she, she sent me her slide, in fact, last night, and they were really good. You, I, I bet you, you, uh, you enjoy it because they're very interesting. And uh, since on her second slide, she had already put her excellent uh, credential. Uh, I just uh, let her uh, use her slide. I mean, and that's it. So let's give her a hand then. And start. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so. Uh, I am Xiao Rong Zhang. Currently, I'm an assistant professor of c computer engineering in the School of Engineering at San Francisco State University. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here today uh, to talk about my research. Uh, so I drove from San Francisco State, and it took like more than two hours to get here. Um, um, but yeah, it, it is a great pleasure to be here. So the title of my research, um, of my talk, is Toward the Next Generation Neural Controlled Artificial Limbs. Okay. Um, so a little bit about myself. So uh, I joined San Francisco State since uh, 2013. So uh, currently I'm a system professor in computer engineering. I also uh, established my research lab called Intelligent Computing and Embedded Systems Lab, ICE Lab. Um, so if you are interested in knowing more uh, about my research and what uh, we have been doing, uh, so this is our, uh, uh, the link of our webpage. And before uh, joining San Francisco State, I completed my PhD in computer engineering from uh, University of Rhode Island. And I'm originally from China and got my bachelor's degree in China, and then I came to US for my master's and the PhD degrees. Okay, so uh, this is just a slide about uh, a screenshot of uh, the web page of my uh, research lab, ICE Lab. Um, so what uh, we're doing uh, in ICE Lab basically what we conduct research on the development of neural machine interfaces. Uh, I will. Uh, explain what is neural machine interface uh, very shortly. And specifically, um, one of the applications for uh, neural machine interfaces is neural controlled artificial limbs. And we also develop real time embedded systems using uh, different computing technologies. And uh, so, besides doing research, uh, I also advise uh, graduate and undergraduate student researchers from San Francisco State. And we also have summer uh, research interns from uh, community colleges for the past few years. Okay, so now uh, my research. First of all, what is neural machine interface? Um, so actually, has anyone uh, uh, know about this device? It is called Myo Armband. Yes, <laughs> oh, that's great. So I, I think I just passed. The, so this is... Um, one of the platforms that uh, we use uh, for our research projects. 
So, what is neural motion interface? So, to answer this question, let's first look at a few uh, examples in science fiction movies. So, I believe most of you know the famous uh, X-Men series. So, it is a um, science fiction movie series about a group of uh, superheroes with uh, special powers. So one of the characters, Jean Grey, the Marvel girl, has a special power of uh, manipulating objects using her kinesis. And another uh, movie, uh, relatively old, uh, is called Matilda. It's also about the little girl, uh, Matilda, who has the special power of moving objects just with his uh, mind power. So the question is, can we really control objects with mind power in real life? And let's look at another example. So this is a, a, a screenshot of a movie, the famous uh, movie series Star Wars. So the major character Luke Skywalker lost his right hand in a duel with his father. And later his missing hand was replaced by a prosthetic one. So this prosthetic hand looks realistic and also functions as if it was Luke's own hand. So is this also a scene that can only exist in science fiction movies? So now, let's back to our original question. So what is neural mesh interface? So basically, neural mesh interface, abbreviated NMI, is a technology that makes such science fiction a reality. So briefly speaking, NMI is a communication pathway between the human neural control system and machine. It utilizes neural activities to control uh, different external devices like a powered wheelchair, a computer game, or prosthesis. So this slide shows a few types of neural signals that can be uh, collected from uh, the human neural control system. This include, uh, these include uh, these uh, neural signals collected from the cortex of the brain, peripheral nerves and neurons, and also muscles. So all these signals, they contain very important information that can represent human states such as emotion, intention, and motion. And basically, this NMI collects neural signals from human neural control system and then uses advanced signal processing uh, or machine learning algorithms to interpret the data to identify human states, that's emotion, intention, and motion, and then make decisions to control external devices. And typically, the hardware and software of the NMI uh, have to be tightly integrated onto embedded systems because uh, usually they have to be wearable and portable. And also NMI is a, a very typical biomedical cyber physical system that features the tight combination of and the coordination between the system's cyber elements, which is uh, the computer, and physical elements. That's the human neural control system and these external devices. Um, so I think maybe most of you know what is an embedded system, but just in case you're not familiar with this concept, so embedded system uh, basically is, is still a computer system. So it is a computer system usually uh, f uh, for some specific dedicated purpose compared to like our PC that's general purpose computers can do a lot of different things. And embedded uh, computer system usually is very small, portable, just like this presenter here, and it has a small computer embedded inside, and it has software running on it. Uh, uh, it has input-output interfaces to interact with uh, our physical world. So we have a lot of applications of embedded systems in our daily life, in communications like your cell phone, uh, like uh, automotive, your remote control of your car, a lot of different applications in many different areas, and we probably use hundreds of embedded systems every day. So, uh, as we just mentioned, for this NMI, uh, uh, typically these uh, neural mesh interfaces are also an application of embedded systems because everything has to be integrated on a self-contained portable wearable device. Okay, so out of, uh, there are a lot of applications of NMIs, but today I'm going to focus on one of these applications that's uh, neural mesh interface for the control of artificial limbs. That's prosthetic, uh, so that's upper limb and lower limb. So uh, this slide shows the neural signals collected from muscles. 
Okay, so these are called electromyogram EMG signals. So EMG signals are effective by electric electric signals for uh, expressing movement intent. So uh, EMG signals can be collected using uh, surface electrode that's just placed on uh, the surface of the muscles. So the device um, uh, you just uh, you have uh, you just seen that's basically a device that can collect. Uh, EMG signals from the user's forearm, so we can just easily slide in uh, this armband, and then there are eight sensors. If you look at the inside of the armband, there those metal, uh, basically they are electrodes. Um, so it has to be placed. Your uh, it has to touch your skin, and when you perform uh, different gestures, basically your muscle act activities will be captured and measured by these EMG signals, and that gonna be. Um, 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 sampled by uh, the analog to digital converters of the uh, microcontroller that built inside that my armband um, and then uh, we have different uh, algorithms to interpret this data to identify uh, the user's intended motions or gestures okay and this uh, figure shows uh, an example of uh, what EMG signal looks like so uh, when you perform different gestures, for example, hand open or hand close, so different gestures, uh, different muscles will have different activities, different contraction contraction levels. So basically, we uh, our uh, purpose is to uh, use this signal processing with machine learning algorithms to find out the patterns um, that that are unique for uh, individual gestures, and then uh, make decisions to identify the user's intended motions or gestures, and then we make decisions to control like a prosthetic hand or like virtual reality game, uh, these kind of applications. But you can see that uh, the raw EMG signals, they're actually very noisy. So there are several steps to process EMG signals and then uh, recognize gestures from these signals. Okay, so, um, for the control, the EMG controlled upper limb prosthesis, they are actually already commercially available devices. Okay, so uh, there is a company called Touch Bionics. So in 2007, uh, they uh, developed uh, a prosthetic hand called iLim Ultra. Okay, so these uh, two photos basically uh, are uh, photos from their uh, web page showing um, this prosthetic hand developed by uh, the company. So this prosthetic hand basically utilizes uh, two EMG sensors, uh, like one on this side, one on this side. So it, it uses a uh, very simple but relatively more reliable signal processing method. I think that's just a like magnitude-based method um, to identify a few different gestures. Okay, and uh, there are uh, five motors in these uh, fingers, so each motor can control like uh, one finger. And, um, uh, and in 2008, uh, the company also made um, these uh, lifelike uh, coverings for their prosthesis. So just from the pictures, from the photos, can you tell like which one is real hand and arm, which one is prosthesis? It's, it's very hard to tell. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually I don't know either, <laughs> but there's for sure one of them is uh, is is just a prosthesis. Uh, another project uh, that is uh, uh, developed by Dakar, uh, so it is funded by DARPA and uh, several uh, research institutions involved in this project. So this is a project uh, launched in 2007. So it has been more than 10 years, and they uh, they they have continuous progress on this project. Um, so this project basically developed this uh, also is EMG controlled uh, bionic arm uh, for uh, multi degree of freedom and uh, uh, control. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, this arm is named Luke after Luke Skywalker. Uh, in Star Wars, meaning that science fiction finally becomes reality. Okay. And uh, so we just talk about this uh, upper limb uh, control. And there are already commercially available devices. But for lower limb control, so, so far um, there are already uh, computerized powered 
prosthetic knees and ankles developed and commercialized, uh, which allowed amputees to uh, negotiate uh, different terrains naturally, perform natural gait patterns on like ground, uh, uh, the, the ground surface, and also do stale ascent, descent, or ramp ascent, descent. So these are just um, two uh, photos from uh, a company called Osser. Uh, this is a prosthetic knee and ankle uh, developed by uh, this company. And this picture shows a prosthetic knee, a powered prosthetic knee, developed by um, uh, University of Rhode Island. That's where uh, where I get my I got my PhD. Uh, so uh, we had a, a big research lab. It's kind of interdisciplinary. We have three professors: one from biomedical engineering, and one from computer engineering, and one from computer science. And we work together. And this prosthetic, uh, this powered. Uh, prosthetic knee was developed by uh, a postdoc uh, in mechanical engineering in our lab. So this uh, video shows um, uh, a testing trial of this prosthetic knee on the amputee subject to perform uh, this treadmill working, level ground working, and ramp ascent. Okay, so um, so this powered, so this computerized powered prosthetic knees and ankles are already available, but without the knowledge of user intent. So when the user has to switch uh, the type of terrain, for example, from uh, level ground walking to stealth ascent, this user has to manually switch the control mode uh, of the prosthesis or using body motion because the uh, the working pattern of the prosthesis on the ground and doing uh, still ascent descent is is very different. So the user have to manually switch the mode or uh, uh, by pressing some buttons or using body motion, which is cumbersome and does not allow smooth task transitions. So our idea, our intention that this neural mesh interface basically is to utilize um, these EMG signals. Uh, and this advanced algorithm that we developed to identify user's intent and then automatically switch the control mode of the prosthesis so that the user can control their prosthetic leg or arm uh, naturally. Okay. But there are, of course, challenges uh, in this uh, project. So this is a cyber-physical system that uh, coordinates the uh, cyber elements, that's the, the computer. Okay, we have hardware and software on the computer, and also the physical systems, that's the uh, human neural control system, and also the prosthesis. So challenges exist uh, in the management of both physical resources and the cyber resources uh, of the system. So for the management of physical resources, um, due to the muscle loss, so uh, patients with uh, uh, amputations, they usually have limited muscles uh, for these EMG signal uh, acquisition. So basically we have to develop um, these uh, signal processing algorithm to accurately identify user's intent from these limited signal resources. And also accuracy is very critical, especially for lower limb control. Okay, so for upper limb control, uh, it, of course, uh, if a system is not like a perfect, that means not like 100% accurate, you're gonna make mistakes. So it, 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 always, it, it makes decisions of what is the user's current gesture or motion or intent. And when it makes mistakes, um, so for upper limb control, uh, the consequence might be uh, if you want to, for example, grab a glass of water, it's just gonna delay, it just, it, you want to do that, but you would just you will just not work in that way. But for lower limb control, this accuracy is even more critical because any mistakes might cause the user to fall. Because uh, if you're working on the level ground and now the control mode of the prosthesis is switched to, for example, stale ascent. So that's very dangerous to uh, the user, actually. So accuracy is very critical. And um, so the reliability and the robot robustness of these neural controlled art artificial limbs can be further complicated by uh, the environmental uncertainty like uh, different kind of noises, motion artifacts, um, and sensor, uh, loose sensors, muscle fatigue, all these kind of uh, 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 factors. And the challenges in the management of computational resources that's from uh, the cyber uh, element side. 
So uh, as we mentioned, we need a tight integration of hardware and the software of the system onto uh, portable embedded systems. And usually they have to operate on batteries as well. So this system has to be real time. It has to respond uh, fast because uh, even the system, even the algorithm is 100% accurate, but if you want to grab this glass of water and it takes five minutes to react, it's just useless, okay? And it has to be memory efficient, it has to be reliable, robust, and also energy efficient because it usually has to, uh, it has to operate on batteries. So uh, to address these challenges, we develop different hardware and software technologies. Um, so this slide shows an overall architecture of our, uh, one of the prototypes of our uh, neural machine interface for uh, lower limb prosthesis control. Um, so there is an embedded uh, uh, computer system. It could be a microprocessor, microcontroller, or like FPGA. So it collects uh, EMG signals and also uh, usually some uh, mechanical signals as well from like uh, inertia measurement unit or uh, from uh, load cell. Um, so all these EMG and the mechanical signals are collected and then we have our software, uh, the signal processing and the machine learning algorithms to uh, decode the intended tasks and transitions uh, of the user and then make decisions uh, and uh, send commands to the prosthesis to uh, automatically switch the control mode. So. For, uh, in order to uh, identify the user's intended motions, um, so uh, EMG signal processing algorithms, uh, there, are, um, uh, there are many, many uh, different algorithms developed for uh, this purpose. So today I'm just going to introduce uh, two basic uh, categories. So one is just very simple methods based on EMG magnitude. Um, so that basically is we just look at the magnitude of the EMG signal. Usually, when you, um, uh, if you, for example, um, if you just close, make a fist, um, if you, uh, uh, so depending on the contraction level of the of the muscle, the magnitude will, uh, the magnitude of the EMG signal will be different. Okay. Um, so this simple method is just based on like we set a threshold. So whenever um, the magnitude of the uh, signal is above some threshold, and then um, the uh, the the change of the control mode is triggered. Okay. So usually for this method, that's we just use individual EMG sensor to kind of control um, like uh, one type of motion. Okay. So usually just if we just use two sensors, so there are only very limited number of uh, decisions can be made. Okay. Uh, but this is a relatively reliable uh, approach. Um, so that is approach that is commonly used in commercially available devices, uh, so products. But it is not appropriate for controlling multifunctional and multi-degree of freedom prosthesis. And the other uh, more advanced method is this machine learning and the pattern recognition algorithms. Basically, um, it can extract more information with uh, fewer monitored EMG signals, okay? So what is uh, pattern recognition or pattern classification? How many of you know the concept of pattern recognition? Okay, all right. So um, for those who might not be familiar with the concept of pattern recognition, I will just give you a very simple, uh, a basic example. Okay. It's uh, like a classic example from uh, pattern recognition textbooks. So consider this scenario. So assume we have a fish processing plant and we want to automate the process of sorting incoming fish according to species. We want to separate salmon from sea bass, just these two types of fish. So the, this, this system here, we have one conveil, uh, conveil uh, belt for the incoming fish, so it's mixed. So we have salmon or sea bass, okay, they are coming in. And then we have uh, these two conveyor belt for the sorted fish, so that is the decision have to, uh, has already been made. And uh, we have one belt for salmon, one belt for uh, sea bass. And we have a robot arm, so this robot arm basically will, uh, so based on the decision, made by this computer, this robot arm gonna pick the fish and according to its species, 
uh, you're gonna uh, just put it uh, into one of the convolve belt. And we also have a camera here to take uh, a picture of each of these fish. And then this picture, that is the data to be fed into this computer and the software on the computer, which is the, this pattern recognition uh, algorithm, going to interpret the data and then make decisions whether it is salmon or sea bass. Okay. So to successfully automate um, uh, this process of sorting these incoming fish, what, is the, what are the necessary steps? Okay. So the key steps for uh, typical key steps for pattern recognition or pattern classification, there were four steps. Data collection, pre-processing, feature extraction, and classification. So data collection is just to acquire the data. So in this example, basically, is the camera. That's the device to capture the data. So for each incoming fish, this, cap this camera captures one image of uh, as a new fish enters the sorting area. So that's the raw data, OK? And then the second step is called pre-processing. So pre-processing is a, a step that, um, uh, for example, we have this image of this fish, okay? So this contains the, the fish, and also it has some like background which is irrelevant information. So this pre-processing involves uh, 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 procedures like uh, noise removal, like just um, uh, separate this, this fish from the background and also segmentation and the usual, like for uh, these kind of EMG, these time series uh, signals, usually we uh, do data analysis on chunks of data instead of each uh, data point, okay? So segmentation uh, sometimes is also uh, required. And then the third step is feature extraction. As we have seen in one of the previous slides, the raw uh, EMG signals are pretty noisy. Uh, you, you can't tell anything from the from the raw data. So this feature extraction step basically is to um, calculate or extract these key features that can characterize this data. So for this uh, special example here, what so what can we do in the feature extraction um, stage? So right now we already have the data of uh, the fish. Okay. So feature extraction, for example, we can calculate the length of the fish, the width of the fish, and the lightness of scales. So basically these are features that might be helpful to uh, separate different classes, different types of fish, okay? But this step is very, very important because not all features are helpful. So it's important to just choose, just select the good features that can help separate these different classes. Some features might get even more confused, okay? So this is a feature extraction step. Then the last one is classification. Classification typically consists of two phases, training and testing. So training is we need to create a model uh, based on a large uh, number of samples. So we let it learn. We want the system to learn okay, from the data and then uh, find out this model by itself. Um, so again, take uh, this uh, fish sorting uh, system as an example. So basically this training is that we, like this is, for example, we just plot two features, okay? Uh, that's the length of the fish and also the average lightness of scales of the fish. So these dots, the, these are, uh, so the, the blue color means uh, the data of sea bass, okay? And the, the red triangles here are salmon data. So this training step is that based on this large uh, number of samples, we already know the labels, okay? We, we already know these are sea bass, these are salmon. So the system gonna find, try to find out a decision boundary that can best separate these two classes, okay? And in this example here, this decision boundary is just a simple linear uh, decision boundary, but uh, uh, we actually have uh, more complex uh, algorithms that uh, that can be also like a non-linear non uh, decision boundary, okay? But the, the, the key is to find out the best boundary that can separate these classes. But of course, we can see that it cannot perfectly uh, does the job. There's still some um, confusion here, okay? So once um, in the training step, we found uh, this decision boundary, and then the second phase that's called testing, put it to work. So that is for 
now the model is already created. Now for any incoming data, uh, uh, so we can just, uh, based on this decision boundary, if this new data, uh, based on its length and average uh, lightness of scale, if this uh, new data uh, is on the left side of the decision boundary, then the system gonna make decision this is a CBAS, okay? If it is on the right side, the system gonna predict it is a salmon. So, uh, of course, it could, be, it could be wrong. So, uh, we need to calculate, to evaluate the uh, performance of a classification algorithm, we calculate the classification uh, accuracy, that is, the number of uh, correctly classified uh, uh, samples divided by the total number of samples, okay? So, um, but this is just a, a like basic idea of what is pattern recognition. So for our um, uh, neural mesh interface for this upper or lower limb uh, prosthesis control, basically the classes are a set of uh, motions. Like for lower limb control, the classes we want to identify is just a set of uh, local motions. Uh, for example, level ground walking, stair ascent, stair descent, stand, sit. So uh, these are the prediction. These are the decisions we want the system to make. So the next few slides, uh, I'm going to show just uh, 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 demonstrations of some of our uh, research results. Um, so this picture shows uh, a prototype of uh, embedded. Uh, system prototype of our NMI for a lower limb control. And this prototype, uh, prototype uh, consists of um, an FPGA device uh, and also a microcontroller. So this microcontroller basically is used to just uh, sample data from uh, these multiple EMG uh, channels. Because um, the microcontroller typically has uh, less computational power. But some of the pattern recognition algorithms are pretty complex, and as we mentioned, it's very important for the system to meet real-time requirement. Uh, so in this particular prototype, we have this FPGA device, which is really good at parallel, uh, uh, parallel computing. Um, to, uh, so FPGA is responsible for uh, the computational intensive tasks uh, in, the, in, the, in the pattern recognition algorithm. And the microcontroller is basically responsible for uh, input output interfaces okay and uh, so we have our prototype and we tested this prototype on uh, several different subjects so before the prototype can be tested on actual uh, amputee subject we usually test it on able body subjects first basically that's ourselves <laughs> just students uh, uh, in the lab um, so but uh, because the, the subject has to wear a prosthesis so uh, this is how we uh, conducted the, the experiment. So we made like a, just an adapter, plastic adapter, so that uh, able body subject can also wear uh, a prosthetic leg. Um, and we have uh, these uh, EMG signals, because we have uh, seven or eight EMG electrodes placed on uh, the subject's uh, leg muscles. Um, so this is a video showing uh, uh, a testing trial of our prototype. So this is the embedded prototype. And we also made a very simple GUI just to display the decisions made by this embedded system. So we can see the subject start from standing. So this is the decision now, it's walking. So this real-time decisions. And standing again, and switches to still ascent. Okay. So uh, this prosthetic leg uh, is still a passive device. It's not a power prosthetic leg. So you can see in the experiment, uh, it's kind of like one, it's the step is like this. It's not like a step over step. Uh, because again, we have to make sure that um, the system is uh, accurate enough and reliable enough to, uh, before testing using uh, uh, powered prosthesis during this step over step. Because for a lower limb, Prothesis, uh, the experiment is very tricky. Uh, I have to make sure the subjects are safe. Um, so the next video shows um, a testing trial and, uh, on the amputee subject for um, just identify his intended transitions between sitting and standing. So these are two simple and basic uh, tasks um, uh, for uh, like normal people, but 
but it's, it's so critical uh, in our daily life. Um, so this is uh, just uh, trial testing uh, the accuracy of the system for just doing sitting and standing. It's kind of, it's hard to see, but now it's, this is standing, so it's just uh, longer and shorter. Um, so, um, so during the, the, um, the experiment, so although the uh, subject kind of like sh uh, uh, shift his uh, weight during standing and move his legs during sitting, uh, but the decision, decisions are still pretty uh, accurate. Okay. And we, uh, we have also developed like um, other evaluation platforms. So instead of just simply um, displaying the text of the decision, we also developed uh, like a virtual reality system to kind of um, just reconstruct uh, our uh, lab environment in this, uh, in this virtual uh, system. And this is a video showing how this neural mesh interface is actually drive, uh, driving the motion of the avatar in this virtual reality system. It's uh, a little bit too dark, but now it's from uh, level ground walking to still descent and then uh, level ground walking again. Okay, so, so these are some experiments um, on uh, the testing of our embedded prototype for uh, neural mesh interface for lower limb prosthesis control. Um, so what we are working on right now is to develop uh, different computing technologies uh, for NMIs. So as we mentioned, um, there is a trade-off between um, the complexity of the algorithm, uh, the, uh, the accuracy, the performance of this algorithm, um, uh, so, because uh, to make such system in practice, it has to concurrently um, meet all the requirements, including high accuracy and real-time response, and this uh, um, this memory and uh, power efficiency. Um, but right now, it's just uh, uh, it's still very challenging because uh, there are many researchers develop investigate different kind of algorithm. Some algorithms are better than others, but usually those uh, more accurate algorithms, they're just more complex. Uh, so most of these algorithms have been tested uh, offline, like uh, using MATLAB or on a desktop PC, and it produced pretty good accuracy, but it just cannot be implemented uh, in real time, especially on embedded system because of their computational uh, complexity. Um, so our idea is to develop uh, a hierarchical computing uh, framework that integrating that integrates uh, different computing technologies, include including this edge computing and also cloud computing. So we uh, have this hierarchical uh, framework that uh, includes uh, microcontrollers. That's the uh, uh, that's the platforms used by uh, most of the embedded uh, systems, and then. Uh, uh, microprocessors, which are a little bit more powerful than microcontrollers, uh, like processors uh, used in uh, smartphones and uh, our PC. And then cloud basically is a platform that have like unlimited uh, computational power and the storage. Okay, but the disadvantage of cloud is that so all the data have to be transferred uh, to the cloud um, uh, using uh, internet. Okay, and this communication latency sometimes is even um, longer than uh, the computational time. So uh, there is a trade-off between the communication latency and the processing time of the computer. So our goal is basically to develop this hierarchical system that can leverage the advantages of all these platforms and then concurrently achieve this uh, 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 this massive computing power and also um, um, uh, uh, real time, uh, massive computing power, massive storage, but also uh, like minimal uh, latency, communication latency. Um, yeah, so this is our goal. So, based on that, um, 
Right now, uh, we, are, we have been working on uh, a platform called MyHMI. So it is a low-cost and flexible uh, research platform. Um, so uh, the purpose of developing this platform is to just provide um, a research platform that can be used by many uh, researchers in this field uh, to, uh, uh, to try out different algorithms, but also uh, can achieve this uh, portability uh, and uh, real-time response. So, because mo uh, right now most uh, EMG-based uh, AMI research is still limited in lab environments. That is, we have to use uh, desktop computers and also we have to use very expensive uh, EMG data acquisition systems. Usually those systems could cost like um, more than, uh, usually it's more than uh, $10,000 just for a few channels. Um, so uh, it is really not practical yet to uh, like do testing in a home setting. Um, and also most uh, open software currently available are based on MATLAB, uh, that is, that needs this uh, uh, license and also it can only run on a PC, it cannot be portable. Uh, so uh, this motivates us to develop this low cost system that utilizes this uh, myo armband which is just $200 and it has these eight uh, EMG channels uh, to collect uh, EMG signals from uh, the forearm. Uh, and also we aim to develop uh, a platform that, that is portable, but it has uh, the capability of uh, processing very complex uh, um, computational tasks. Okay. So what is my armband? So this is just um, kind of like a commercial video for uh, this uh, armband. So it is an uh, armband developed by uh, a company called Atomic Labs, a company in Canada, but they now they also have an office in San Francisco. So it is a very neat design that uh, normally for um, the data acquisition system used in lab environment, those electrodes we have to use, those conductive gel. So it's even just for the experimental setup, it needs like, like uh, at least 30 minutes to place all the sensors and it has a lot of wiles and everything. Very bulky system. Uh, but this one is very, uh, is low price, low cost, and also uh, very easy to use. But of course it has its disadvantage that um, the sampling frequency of the EMG signals is just 200 hertz versus 1000 hertz that's typically used by uh, those expensive e equipment uh, in a lab environment. So this 200 hertz, I think that's because of the uh, bandwidth limitation of this Bluetooth communication. Okay, so, um, but the, I, the original idea of this uh, my armband is to have a device that can, so you can remotely control a lot of different things just uh, using uh, your gestures. Okay, it's kind of like an intuitive control uh, concept. Originally, they don't release uh, raw data from the my armband. Basically, it's just like a toy and you can use it to control your presentations and videos and these kind of things. Um, but later, uh, there are so many uh, requests uh, for the company to release raw data and finally now we can get raw data and then try our own algorithm to uh, interpret uh, the signals. Originally, there are default gestures can be uh, produced by uh, the device and that's it. You cannot, uh, if you are interested in some other customized gestures, it's not possible. But right now, um, because of the raw data are available, so we can use our own algorithm to uh, customize gestures. Okay. So this is some uh, details about this uh, uh, my armband. Um, so, uh, so it has SDK that can uh, uh, allow the user to uh, develop uh, their own software on Windows operating system, Mac, iOS, and Android, and it has these eight EMG sensors. Also, it has a nine-axis uh, inertia measurement unit, include three-axis accelerometer, three-axis gyroscope, and three-axis magnetometer. And uh, the uh, data transfer is uh, to use uh, Bluetooth uh, low energy, so uh, it really has a bandwidth limit. And these are the default gestures provided by the armband. 
So as we mentioned, our uh, objectives for this uh, Mile HMI project is to produce uh, a software platform that's providing this uh, interface with my armband uh, and also uh, it can be interfaced with other uh, devices too. Uh, but right now we have only tested uh, on the my armband. And the software basically is uh, highly modular and um, scalable. Um, and different feature extraction and uh, pattern classification algorithm have, have been implemented. And the goal of this project is to make uh, it uh, open to the public uh, in uh, a few years uh, so that uh, the researchers can uh, add their own algorithms uh, on, uh, the, on this uh, software and uh, test it with uh, my armband or other uh, EMG acquisition devices. So, for, so far we have developed uh, two versions. So one is a PC-based version, uh, which is just called Mile HMI. We have a few papers published uh, based on this uh, implementation, and it's developed using C and C++. Uh, it's running on Windows operating system, and uh, a mobile version that is developed in Android Studio. So now it's uh, Android-based uh, portable version of the uh, Mile HMI. Uh, so both platforms um, has so it integrates a sequence of signal processing uh, modules, uh, including feature extraction and the pattern classification. And also it has interface of uh, uh, data acquisition and also output control uh, to control different evaluation platforms. So for this project, um, a special note about this project is that um, um, this research project is integrated with um, an internship program that uh, collaborated by uh, San Francisco State and the Kenyatta College, that's a community college uh, also in the Bay Area. Uh, so it is called uh, Comics Internship Program. So every summer uh, there are uh, around like 20 students come to uh, San Francisco State and they're going to uh, join different research labs to do a 10 week uh, internship uh, project. Um, so every uh, so I think since 2014 I have been advising interns from Kenyatta College and every time I have uh, four to six uh, interns working in my lab in the summer and they're advised they're also mentored by um, uh, graduate students uh, in our school um, so in these 10 weeks uh, they actually did a lot of things they have this uh, they're because they're just community college students, fresh, uh, uh, no, sophomore students. So uh, the only um, requirement for them is to have a, is they have to take a basic uh, programming class, like C or Java, that's it. Um, and then after they join the lab, they start to do uh, like about two weeks literature study and learn uh, all these new concepts. And then skills training, like uh, uh, programming uh, and also uh, this uh, to understand the actual the, the the mathematical algorithms of these machine learning and pattern recognition algorithms, and also uh, the actual implementation of the Myo HMI, HMI platform. And the, at the end of the program, they have to do um, a final oral presentation, a postal presentation, and also a writing uh, a report. They actually did pretty uh, well. Uh, every year, I was. Uh, it was just uh, uh, always uh, out of my expectation. They always did better than what I originally expected. Uh, so these are just some photos of the interns working in my lab. Um, so this is just uh, uh, the, this uh, PC version, Myo HMI, developed by majorly uh, develop, mainly developed by these interns and mentored by one uh, graduate student. Um, so this uh, platform we can see has a, a GUI, and then it has several modules. So uh, all these modules can these are uh, uh, are highly modulized, and they can be uh, easily uh, changed uh, if needed. And we have this data acquisition, and then uh, feature extraction, classification, uh, training, and testing, and then output control. So this output control, we can make decisions to control. Um, we have uh, several, we have a few different uh, evaluation platforms so far in our lab. One is a 3D printed prosthetic hand. Um, it is also 
developed by just one uh, uh, undergrad student um, in our school, uh, majoring in mechanical engineering. Uh, and we have a virtual arm uh, that's developed by an undergrad student uh, in uh, computer engineering. So this is uh, developed using Unity uh, software. Okay. So this is just a, a screenshot of uh, the GUI of the PC version MyOHMI. So we have uh, several different tabs and to connect uh, up to two MyO armbands. And then we have um, uh, the real-time displaying of all these EMG uh, signals. We have this, uh, this pie uh, chart uh, to show the, uh, the magnitude of the EMG signals because this is uh, like a round armband. Right? And we, uh, so this is like IMU, so this is showing the IMU data. And this is the, uh, the pattern classification part. So the next slide is just a video shows a demonstration of this uh, MyOHMI platform. So the student is wearing this My armband. We, we have this virtual uh, arm and also this uh, prosthesis. Oh, my video is a little bit <laughs> weird. So this is making fist and point, and fist again. Uh, I think the lag is because of the video, it's not because of our system. But, the, but, this, uh, but this prosthesis does have more um, noticeable delay uh, compared to uh, the, the virtual arm, because uh, there is some issue with the the microcontroller that controls uh, uh, the prosthetic hand, okay, uh, and that sh uh, that can be addressed. Uh, excuse me. Yep. This uh, in this case uh, there were like what eight uh, eight sensors then? Uh, yeah, just uh, just uh, eight EMG sensors around the uh, forearm. Yeah. So basically, yeah. just uh, the muscles, the right. muscles yeah. here. Now, when let's say that uh, somebody does not have the, the mm -hmm. arm. And then now, if you want to control uh, from from the top mm. uh, part, now the point is that you need to be able to to move the hand this way. And then now there are five five fingers and so forth, and then mm. also the the palm. Mm -hmm. In this case, now how many how many sensors do you really need? Uh, I mean, the number of sensors is not the key part. You can put as many as you want, actually. Uh, and so this is just. Uh, one of our research projects right now. We are also doing, uh, uh, another part of our research is right now using, it's called grid sensors. Right. So instead of just like this uh, um, one array of sensor or like individual channel placed on uh, muscles, we use like a matrix of sensors. So even in a very small area, we have like maybe hundreds of channels there. Um, so that gonna give us richer uh, information, uh, neuromuscular information, but of course it can generate more computational burden. Right. So now uh, that part of the research is to investigate whether uh, this grid sensor can provide more uh, information to uh, do more accurate uh, um, uh, gesture identification. But for, for your question, that's for uh, uh, amputee that um, lost the whole uh, forearm. So uh, there are some, um, uh, there is a research project in uh, the Johns Hopkins University. They're also just using this my armband, but the armband is worn here, is worn here. And also there is a surgery called um, uh, targeted muscle renovation. Um, so like one of the very early slides you have seen that patient basically had lost the whole arm. So, but that patient can still uh, use his muscle to control uh, the fingers of prosthetic arm. So that patient's, uh, 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 there is a surgery conducted for that patient that's called, that's this uh, target, targeted muscle renovation. So basically that's the, the chest muscle. Uh, it's kind of a rewild uh, the nerves uh, here to the chest muscle. So he basically is using his chest muscle to, uh, to control uh, the prosthesis. Uh, it will not be as intuitive as like if you just lost a hand, you still have your resi uh, residual muscle of, uh, of right. the uh, of the arm. So he has to he has to do some training to learn 
um, like how I can uh, basically contract my muscles to basically to uh, produce different patterns of the muscle activity so that it can, um, uh, it can control, uh, it can, uh, can be associated with different motions of the prosthesis. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is uh, just a picture, a photo of uh, their um, final poster presentation, our presentation, and our group was the winner for that year. Um, and uh, so, uh, so another part of our uh, ongoing project is uh, we are also developing uh, virtual reality systems, like uh, virtual reality games for, for example, stroke rehabilitation, uh, that can also be interfaced with uh, this neural machine interface. Um, so that's also part of our research. So basically, this uh, virtual reality um, system can give the user an immersive environment um, that can um, basically help the training to do the rehabilitation and also uh, even just for simple uh, entertainment, like just gaming purpose. So we also have, um, I have a video showing a virtual reality system developed by also our intern, so, so this is the, at the beginning, this is the, just the GUI of the Mayo HMI. And uh, one of the interns developed a virtual reality game, it's a first person shooter game, a zombie shooting game. And we can see um, the subject is wearing an Oculus logo, and also my arm that on his right arm. And he just, because uh, the, the Oculus has the, this head tracking, um, feature and basically he's just using his gestures to shoot to uh, reload weapon uh, to for example turn on turn off the light change the environment settings this kind of thing so now he turned off the light Control, we don't have to use because, because when, when you wear the goggle, you cannot see uh, the physical world, you cannot see the mouse and keyboard that used to control these games. So now you can just use your gestures uh, to do the control. Yeah, and this so that's this game was also just developed in that 10 weeks. And this slide shows uh, the mobile version of our Mario HMI. So this is an Android app um, that integrates all these signal processing modules. So this is uh, uh, one of the tab that's um, showing the real-time EMG signals from the Mario armband. So we have eight sensors. So when you tap uh, any of these sensors, you will just show the signal for that channel. many animations. And this is uh, the feature extraction tab. So this, uh, you also use uh, just a pie chart to show um, the features uh, that are calculated from each of these EMG channel. And then we have a classification tab to do the pattern classification. So we, you can, the user can easily select the pattern recognition algorithm and then do the training and testing. Um, and also we have, uh, so this mobile version also have um, the access to the cloud computing platform that's Amazon uh, Web Services. And so all this data can be uh, transferred to the cloud and then also processed in the cloud if we want. Um, so this slide just shows the, the list of classifiers, classification algorithms we implemented uh, on the mobile version of the Mayo HMI. All right, so 
last slide basically uh, lists our ongoing work. So we're uh, adding uh, more uh, classification algorithms and feature extraction algorithms into our platform. And uh, currently our um, evaluation has only been done on uh, EMG signal processing. Um, but the, the, uh, my armband also has IMU data, so we're going to integrate them to see uh, if it will give us better performance. And we're also investigating various uh, edge computing and the cl cloud computing platforms. So besides um, like uh, these smartphones, tablet, and the cloud, we are also investigating other, right now is a, a very emerging concept, it's called fog computing. So that's uh, that's to bring the computing computing power closer to the edge, so we can use like a gateways, um, like routers, and any any computing nodes in the environment uh, to do the computational intensive task. Um, so uh, we need to basically quantify uh, and also have a good balance of the computational delay and the communication latencies of these different computing layers. And uh, as we mentioned, our goal is uh, in a few years, we're going to make the whole system open to the public so that everyone can benefit from it. So I think that's all for my presentation today. And if you have any questions, please. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that today, the hard band is just put there. How accurate, uh, um, how accurately can, can, you, can you put there, uh, I mean, on the arm water so that it can just sense quickly? I mean, you really need to spend some time to put it on the, on the right place? Uh, I mean, no, it, uh, it, it, as long as it touches uh, uh, the muscle, uh, yeah. it is fine. It doesn't need a long time to place right. the myoarm. Because down. for each motion, I mean, there's a sensor, I mean, and then we don't know where it is, and you need to really Yeah, that's a very that. good question. So that's the good thing about pattern recognition algorithm, that it, the location of the sensor doesn't really uh, matter uh, because it basically it is using this um, this multiple muscle uh, multiple sensors that cover all these areas. It is not important to really precisely uh, locate the sensor that uh, uh, on the muscle. Right. Um, but the, the the simple, I mean the uh, the commercially available devices, the algorithm they use is or the older algorithm, they really need to um, carefully place uh, all these sensors according to where the, the muscle uh, is. But pattern recognition, because the system learn um, these pat as long as when the user perform different motions, it does have different patterns, um, the system can learn that and create a model. So, yeah. Now, can this thing be uh, this type of uh, sensors are found to be used in the ALS that is, uh, you know, the one, ALS is the, is the neural disease that uh, basically the motors, the, uh, the, uh, the neurons for the, for the, I mean, for the motors and so on to make, to, to do things and so forth are gone, right? So in that case, would, would they be, I mean, can we use them also there or not? Uh, it depends. I mean, uh, yeah, even for amputee, uh, Especially for patients, patients with different conditions, the our muscle activities are could be quite different. Uh, um, so it depends on the condition of the of the patient. Um, yeah, it works better on some patients, but not so well on some other patients. Um, but the because for this machine, this pattern recognition method is it conducts a training uh, at first, so you will learn the pattern from this uh, individual. Uh, that's that's better. But still, if it's just if the if the pa if the patient just cannot, I mean, uh, it depends on the quality of the of the signals that can be collected. Yeah, if it's very difficult for the for the patients to uh, to to produce uh, this uh, this this consistent and different patterns for different motions, then uh, the performance will not be very good. Yeah. So that's why for some patients they have to conduct the surgery. Right. Yeah. I see. Another question that I have is that: Are you planning to produce uh, other sensors than the motion, like for example temperature and humidity? Because uh, this is something that uh, people may need. 
right? Yeah. Um, are, you, are you planning to, to improve those also? Um, so for this uh, particular project, we haven't we haven't done that yet. Yeah, but we do have uh, uh, because I advise a lot of uh, master students for their for their for their master project. Um, yeah, many of them are doing this kind of uh, uh, basically is to uh, collect different physiological uh, uh, signals and other signals from from user and then yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me more about your pattern recognition algorithm? I mean, you write it from scratch or you use it as a good method? The pattern recognition algorithm? So you write it uh, from you wrote it uh, from your scratch or like uh, or what technology do you use or, or else you you said you use it? Uh, most of the algorithms are already existing okay. algorithms, so they have been. Uh, they have been uh, applied to different areas. Uh, so uh, some of the algorithm is just they have not been tested on this particular problem uh, yet. Uh, so we we basically uh, try out different algorithms, but we, we the algorithms are existing algorithms. Oh. We didn't develop them and from what scratch. What kind of AWS tool do you use for this project? AW. You said you use AWS right for cloud computing. Yeah. Yeah. So what what do you use in it? I mean. What uh. So for uh for the we currently using uh, uh EC2 uh to just do the storage and also uh, computation and we are also right now uh in, for for this fog computing concept we are investigating AWS uh, Greengrass so that is uh, a service that can. Basically, uh, it's it's kind of like a cloud computing, but it's really not the cloud to do the computing. Is the is the yeah lambda yeah yeah yeah. 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 Sorry, it looks like yeah, some people have to be because they have classes. Yeah, they have classes. So oh, okay. Please so do not take it personally. <laughs> yeah, since uh, this already now uh, five uh, forty. If there are no more questions, so let's just stop now here. And then if you have more questions, in fact, we can, uh, we can, we can ask uh, when you are having the class. Right? Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you.